When I first tested my Prusa Mini, it fell below my expectations. Today we're going to see if things have improved with updates from Prusa and a Bontech upgrade extruder and heat break kit. When the Prusa Mini was announced, I ordered one excitedly because I saw it as the perfect small printer to sit next to me on my desk for small print projects. As a satisfied owner of a Prusa Mark III, my expectations were pretty high, but when it arrived, although there was a lot to like about it, it was unreliable and the print quality wasn't quite there. This video is not a review, but it is a follow-up on my experiences with the Prusa Mini. Prusa has released several firmware and slicer updates since then, and I've also purchased a Bontech upgrade extruder as well as heat break, which I'll be testing with a range of before and after prints. How much have things improved? Let's find out. Let's start with a brief recap of how my Prusa Mini has performed so far. When I did my initial video, I had some truly impressive prints. The parts produced were accurate and fit really well together. And while not perfect, some of them were extremely pretty to look at too. Others, however, had some fine stringing that seemed hard to dial out. This is despite using Prusa filament as well as Prusa slicer with the Prusa created slicing profiles. Most concerning, however, was my failed prints. My mini was suffering from intermittent under extrusion, and that made for some very gappy and weak parts. The drive gear of the extruder was churning out filament dust and I discovered that a combination of too short a PTFE tube and poor assembly of the hot end was creating a cavity for filament to expand and jam. I fixed this by swapping to a slightly longer length of PTFE tube and I haven't had any complete failures since but some of my test prints have been really horrible. Most of them had some sort of banding from inconsistent extrusion and this duct here is probably the worst print the printer has ever done. In the time since I received the printer, Prusa has been very active in supplying firmware updates, each with detailed change logs and I took the opportunity to continually upgrade. A big release was version 4.0.5 as it introduced Prusa Connect Local. This adds a built-in interface like Octoprint and you use it by connecting your printer via an ethernet cable and using your browser to connect to the printer's IP address. Currently, implementation is limited and you can only do simple monitoring, so you have to start prints manually on the printer, but then mid-print, you are supplied with the progress, expected time, as well as a log of the temperatures. According to Prusa, in time the features will be greatly expanded and there will also be an optional Wi-Fi module. In the meantime, the Mini is completely compatible with Octoprint. The other thing that's undergone a lot of development are the slicing profiles for the Mini in Prusa Slicer. And another addition that I'm really happy with is support for Simplify 3D with an official Prusa profile. Simply download the zip and import into S3D. I've used the Mini here and there on my projects, such as printing the test clips in the car airbox video, as well as more recently in the IKEA wardrobe fix video, and those parts are still going strong. Visually, things have improved, but extrusion is still a little bit inconsistent. You can see there's some gappy parts and some banding on the vertical surfaces. This cylinder is a test piece I did for this video, and the one on the left is pretty typical of what I'm getting from my Mini. The one on the right has a particularly nasty bit. Fortunately, the Mini rarely produces extrusions this poor anymore. If we look on the Prusa forums, we'll find people having similar extrusion issues to me, some of them worse, some of them not as bad. It's worth pointing out that there's also plenty of people happy with the performance of their printer, and I'm not suggesting that every Prusa Mini is unable to print well. But based on my own machine, I would like it to perform a little better. One of my patrons informed me of this product, the Bontech Dual Drive Extrusion Upgrade Kit for the Prusa Mini. I had fitted a similar kit to my Prusa Mark III in the past, and although pricey, I was very happy with the quality and performance. As the name suggests, this one uses a dual drive to grip the filament from each side. It's also a bolt-on proposition, so I ordered one at US $65. I also ordered the Bontech heat break kit for the Prusa Mini. It's made from stainless steel and features a narrower section, both aimed at reducing heat creep minimizing clogs and under extrusion. 
This one cost me US $15. And it's worth noting that both of these products were developed according to Bontech after extensive testing revealed problems with the Prusa Mini. It's also worth mentioning that this is a community source design based on a design originally generated by Olaf Ogland. The product went from Sweden to Australia quite fast. It was well packaged and came with a welcome card, a shiny Bontech sticker, assembly hardware and cable ties, as well as the actual extruder. This is made from laser centered nylon. It's very lightweight and it feels very high quality. A look inside reveals the dual drive gears so the filament can be gripped tightly from both sides. The heat brake came in its own bag and also included some PTFE tube. Before fitting these parts, I decided on another before test print, the Maya Death Whistle. This one printed fairly well, but there are still some horizontal marks on the vertical surfaces where the extrusion has been inconsistent. We've got a nice sample of before prints, so let's install the upgrades. Well done to the author Nuno, because in my opinion, the online instructions are a 10 out of 10. Everything is broken down step by step with multiple pictures, and if you skim through, it seems like a much more involved process than it is, but this is really only a 15 to 20 minute job. It's just that the instructions are extremely descriptive. We start by moving the print head up to the very top and to the very left when looking from the front. And then after that, we unload the filament and power down the machine. The disassembly portion is quite easy. We follow the instructions, cutting cable ties, unscrewing fittings, and removing bolts until the feed system is separate from the machine. We then continue to unscrew until all of the old parts are sitting separate on the table. That'll leave the extruder stepper bare so we can remove the drive gear. Time for assembly and we start by reusing our small length of PTFE tube followed by the brass fitting using the coarser of the two threads to screw into the Bontech extruder. This is meant to be done by hand but I found I needed to hold a socket to get some grip because more torque than I was expecting was required. It did go in cleanly and I was able to do a final tighten with a 10mm spanner. Next, we installed the Bontech gear on the output shaft of the extruder stepper, cleverly using a cable tie as a spacer. We insert some bolts into the back of the extruder mechanism, align those with the holes in the stepper motor, and then tighten the bolts to join the two together. More bolts are inserted into the Bontech piece and then we align and use those to attach the new extruder to the Prusa Mini frame. We can now start to attach various fittings, the exit and entry for the PTFE tube, cable tying the wiring loom in place after ensuring that there's sufficient distance and slack, and inserting the thumb screw that determines how much tension there is in the dual drive mechanism. The gearing of the new extruder means that it will turn in reverse without a small wiring change. This is the fiddliest part of the job, but it's still quite easy. We simply remove the electronics cover, unplug the extruder stepper, which reveals black, green, red and blue wires. We need to switch the red and the blue, so we apply pressure on the metal locking tab, which will allow them to be pulled out of the plug. We now reinsert them, except in reverse order, which will give us black, green, blue and red. We plug the extruder stepper back into the main board, seal up the case and our physical install is done. Our new extruder requires new e-steps to the value of 415. However, as of version 4.0.5, the usage of the EEPROM changed and that means you can no longer store Marlin values like e-steps in a way that persists after the machine is powered off. On any other machine, we would connect via console, send an M92 command to set the e-steps followed by an M500 to save, but as you can see here, when I power up the printer and reconnect, the e-steps have returned to their original value. I could recompile the firmware to enable M500, but it physically involves breaking a tab on the mainboard. This is irreversible and voids the warranty of the printer's electronics. To combat this, we have two potential workarounds. We can download the G-code file from the Bontech instructions, the contents of this file simply contain the M92 G code with the new e-steps and we can apply the e-steps by printing the file every time we turn on the printer. The other thing we can do is follow the instruction to add the M92 G code into the start G code of our slicer. 
That way, every time we start a new print, the correct e-steps are loaded into the firmware to prevent under extrusion. That concludes installation of the extruder upgrade. So let's now install the new heat break. And once again, we have really detailed and fantastic instructions to follow. We start by heating up the nozzle to 280 degrees. We can then support the heater block and use a socket to unscrew the nozzle. We now let the printer cool down before we continue. Like with the extruder upgrade, our initial steps all concern disassembly. The first item being the Minder probe, which is placed safely to the side. We then loosen the set screws that hold in the heater cartridge as well as the thermistor, and we push those out of the heater block from behind with an Allen key. We remove the PTFE fitting from the top of the hot end assembly, loosen the three grub screws that hold in the heat break, and then wiggle the heat break downwards out of the machine. Comparing the old to the new, we can see that the new has almost identical dimensions apart from the narrower section above the thread. Reassembly begins by screwing the nozzle into the heater block all the way in and then backing off half a turn and then screwing in the new heat break from the opposite side until the two meet. We then need to apply thermal paste to the top of the new heat break. This is one thing that wasn't included in the kit that I would very much like to see. The new assembly slides up into place from underneath. We clean off any excess thermal paste before retightening the three grub screws to hold it in place. Now we insert the piece of PTFE tube that came with the new heat break. It's important to make sure that the side with the chamfer faces downwards towards the nozzle. With a bit of a wiggle, we're able to push it vertically down into place. And now we reinsert the original threaded insert. Once again, the coarser side of the thread is the one we're engaging here. Now the Bowden tube that connects the feeder to the hot end is screwed back into place and we can reinsert the heater and thermistor cartridges securing them from underneath. One other thing I'm adding is a temporary E3D V6 silicon sock. It's temporary because it's not quite a perfect fit. The main problem is that the mini hot end has this little cutout to clear the part cooling fan flow and the E3D sock has a square edge which is going to partially block the part cooling. While browsing the forums I found a link to this community member shop who sells silicon socks to suit the mini complete with the angled edge to not interfere with part cooling. When this arrives from Europe, I'll be replacing the E3D sock. The Minder probe can now be reattached, but we do need to reposition it because our nozzle height might have changed, so we slide it up and out of the way, ready for recalibration. Before that, we once again heat the nozzle up to 280 degrees, and once it's up to temp, we do a final hot tighten of the nozzle to the heat block. Once everything cools down, we can power off the machine and manually wind the nozzle down until it just touches the bed. We then fold an 80 GSM piece of paper three times, place it on top of the bed and slide the Minder probe down until it just touches. The retaining bolt for the Minder probe can now have its final tighten. For the new heat break, we have some new PID auto-tune values as suggested by Bontech. But since I'd added a silicon sock on top of this, I decided to perform my own PID auto-tune using M303. Once the tuning was done, I took the previous G-code file from Bontech and added my own PID values in a line after the M92. I called this file bootme and I can run it every time I start up the printer to load in my e-steps and PID values. If you want to stick with Bontech's suggested PID values, once again, we have a G-code file that we can download and run when we boot the printer. And I'd still recommend adding these to your start G-code in your slicer, so they're applied automatically at the start of every print. Since we reassembled the nozzle as well as the Minder probe, our final step is to rerun the first layer calibration, discarding our old value and using the rotary encoder to get the perfect amount of squish as the calibration pattern is laid down. And with that, the installation of both of our upgrades is complete and we can proceed on to some comparison test prints. For the IKEA wardrobe clips, I'd say the results were slightly improved. Overall they look similar, but in specific parts, there's definitely less banding. Some artifacts remain, such as on this upper surface, but other areas, such as the round wall, are much cleaner after the upgrades. 
when it comes to the test cylinder. In most lighting conditions, they look fairly close, but when you move the light to above, you can see there's noticeably less banding on the after, and this is true for both slices. The death whistle, once again, is a little bit cleaner. If we see the before on the left, there's a lot more surface artifacts that simply aren't evident in the reprint. It's not a perfect print, but it's definitely improved. I was doing well for time, so I decided to do a couple of more test prints. This stepped bin, designed by Devin Montes from Make Anything, came out quite flawlessly. It's in vase mode, so a single extrusion around the whole perimeter, and it's pretty consistent the whole way up the print. Finally, this miniature milk crate. A pretty difficult print in terms of small areas and needing a lot of attractions. There is some minor stringing there. Overall, it's not a bad print, but there's definitely still some areas with some inconsistencies. Whether this is down to the model, the slicer, or the printer, I'm not sure. The Mini is still not in my upper level of printers when it comes to print quality, but after fitting these upgrades, I do feel it is printing better than it ever has before. This is just one person's viewpoint, however, so I'll link below two threads on the Prusa forums with people giving feedback about both of these upgrades. Prusa deserves some credit for actively developing this printer and releasing many firmware updates. Prusa Local Connect also looks quite promising, and I look forward to when it's more fully featured and works with Wi-Fi. The removal of saving to EEPROM in their firmware, however, to me seems like a big own goal. Just by fitting a silicon sock and wanting to do a PID auto-tune, it's very hard to save the value and use it reliably. If you like the earthy matte colours found in my later test prints, the filament is from the new range of recycled PLA available from X3D. And if you only do one print for Halloween, make sure it's this death whistle. That's it from me, but I would like to know, if you're the owner of a Prusa Mini, are you happy with the print quality and did you have to perform any upgrades to get it working to your satisfaction? Please leave your thoughts down below in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.